Last week, we talked about being shaken. How many of you felt a little more confident this week knowing Jesus Christ, you can't be shaken? Isn't it awesome to see these things out of Hebrews? And I want you to know for the first 12 chapters of Hebrews, you have been getting pure doctrine about what we understand about Christ, about what we understand about God, about sacrifice, about propitiation. In other words, the sacrifice that satisfies for all time. There's been a comparison of Mount Sinai versus Mount Zion. And not so much verses, just a picture of both of them and which one are you at. We looked last week and we talked about things that are shaken and things that are unshakable as a Christian. If you weren't here last week, I want you to know if you claim the name of Jesus Christ and have that relationship with him, when the rest of the world is shaken unto destruction, you are eternal because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary and because of who lives within you. All God's people ought to say. It's interesting because as he finishes up, and, and Paul does this as well in, in, in Romans. I'm not saying Paul wrote Hebrews, but in chapter 12, Paul then says, therefore. Uh, in other words, in 11 chapters, he has talked about doctrine in Romans. And when he comes to that 12th chapter, he says, now let's put some legs on this thing. I want you, I beseech ye to present yourselves as living sacrifice, it says in, in Romans. But at, in Hebrews, we come to the 12th chapter, we see all of these things, all the doctrinal issues, and now he says, let's apply this to our life. Okay? You will find this pattern throughout the New Testament. In fact, you'll see some of it in the Old Testament, but even more beautifully in the New Testament. Doctrine precedes doing. If you're doing and you don't understand why you're doing it, you're doing it in vain. Think about it. People who say, oh, just throw doctrine out, it doesn't matter and everything like, throw you out. (laughs) Doctrine is important. It's the absolutes that God has given us and said, this is what it ought to look like. This is how you ought to believe. These are the things that you ought to hold dear. Here's the problem. If we don't hold anything dear, how can we go out in the world and tell them about a God? that holds things very dear. See how it works? So when we come to chapter 13 of Hebrews, you're not shaken, and therefore, because you're not shaken because of who you are in Christ Jesus, there are some things that he says you ought to be doing. Tonight I'm going to deal with several of them. I'm going to deal with verses 1 through 3. Maybe saying, why? Well, let's take a look at it for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourself also are in the body. I hope this intrigues you just a little bit to say, I'm going to be back tonight to see what he has to say. The reality of it is we should love. And notice what it says about this. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of tonight's message just to kind of whet your appetite. But when it says in that first verse, let love of the brethren continue, some would say, oh, that means love the whole world. No, it doesn't. This is written to the Hebrews. Who are the brethren? The Hebrews. They were supposed to love one another. In fact, they had laws and rules and everything else. We're going to look at some of those things tonight. And we're hopefully going to come to a little bit better understanding or a little more illumination about this idea. You know, the world takes these love passages all through the Bible, and there's plenty of them. But they take them and say that applies to us. But I have found in my studies that it does not apply. There are only a few passages that apply to the world. Because here's the thing. Most of us would rather love the world than love the brethren. Because the world is the place where our kinfolks, our family, our children live. And we want to, we want to take care of them and we want to love them and all those kind of things. But God says, wait a minute, this is what love looks like. And so we basically have to reject the things of God to come to a place where we can love the things of this world. And the Bible says that the love of the world is hatred toward God. Sad to say. So tonight, if you're going, all right, I want to change. If a landmine just went off in your life, I hope you'll be back tonight. Because we're going to be talking about those things that are important. But today, I want to deal with verse 4. 
God's laid this on my heart, and, and I want you to know he's laid out the next uh, four or five sermons, actually, in my heart, and, and he can change them at any time. But I would share with you that we've talked about all of the greatness of God. You can either go to, to Sinai or you can go to Zion. You can be shaken or you can not be shaken. All of those things. But it comes down to, if you say, I am unshakable because of Christ Jesus in me, should we love? Just hoping there's a response out there. I don't know, Brother Jack, maybe. Is that what I'm hearing? Should we love? Should we love one another? You bet. Is it important that we show hospitality to others? Yes, yes. yes it is. So do I, do I need to correct you or fix you on those issues? Should we also remember those who are in prison and so that you know the, the, the imprisonment is not just about those who committed murder and everything like that. It's about Christians who are being imprisoned for serving and following Christ. Be careful what you do with that verse. While we can make applications today, it had a specific meaning. Is it important that we are the, the champions for those who are ill-treated, those that are not unfairly treated as Christians? I'm glad there's three or four people out there that understand what they're supposed to be doing. Since you yourselves are also part of the body, I hope you'll be here tonight. But verse 4 deals with something very specifically. And today as I speak about it, I hope you know that I'm going to be taking a little bit different tone where usually I'm, I'm, uh, and everything like that. I want you to know something. God's word is pure. It's true. And I have nothing I can do except to preach it with the conviction they just put in my heart and in my life. But I can tell you about the subject matter today. I know that there are a lot of landmines. I know that some of you have come through bitter divorces. I know that some of you have gone through irreconcilable differences. I know that some of you have been caught up in various and illicit affairs and things that you ought not to be, or you maybe know somebody who has, and you're supposed to be the one giving them counsel about these things. But today, as I speak about this issue, I don't speak about it beating on the pulpit. I speak about it because it affects every church. It affects many who are in this building today. So I want to show you some things about the importance of marriage. Not so that you can go out and preach to a lost world. The lost world is not going to hold in regard high those things of God. They're not going to. They're going to try and uh, basically eliminate God out of the equation and just make it a word that just means some kind of a union. But God says it's much more than that. I have to also tell, and I've tried to tell everybody that I've talked to in these last several weeks, this message is not about you. If you notice, it's in a chronological order here. I'm not jumping over to say, I'm preaching this message just for you. But the message that I preach today, many of you, or some of you, may I say, because you'll be looking around saying, who, who, I wonder who. Um, I have spoken with you about, I am not divulging anything we've discussed, but I have to tell you something, God's word deals with the very things you're dealing with. And the only thing that I could do when I met with you was to point you to God's Word. And so today, if I reiterate it by pointing you back to God's Word once again, let God speak in your life. Let Him speak, not because I'm speaking it or because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm judging or anything else. Just let God's Word speak and flow through you. Let the Holy Spirit accomplish what needs to be accomplished within you as we look at marriage today. This is one of those messages as I spoke last week. It's a landmine. It's a field with tons of them, and I'm looking at all of them. All of you have been affected by something in marriage along the way. Today's message is not a message of judgment. It's a message of instruction. It's a message to help you understand. For those of you who are dabbling, for those of you who may think it's okay, for those of you who have been uh, uh, tempted by uh, your own flesh, by the, the world and all that they're doing, I want you to know God gives some very explicit instructions on things that you can be doing. And I share them with you, not in judgment. I share them with you because if no one speaks about these things, then people will never know what God's Word says. Because we won't go and study these subjects, especially if our marriage or relationships are not right in our life. We won't want to know about any of this. So as I speak to you today, I hope and pray that God's Spirit would move in you, remove all the landmines you've placed or all the landmines that are in your life, so that you're able to say, God, I hear you. I understand what you want to do. 
she's just getting a Kleenex. It's okay. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it's only one verse that speaks about it. But for the Jew, for the Hebrew, they knew that this was important. And so he didn't have to speak a whole lot about it. In fact, we're going to look at Thess- uh, Thessalonians. We're also going to be looking at 1 Corinthians because we're going to be looking at what Paul has to say about it. But we also see places where Jesus has something to say about marriage as well. So with that in mind, let us go to that passage that is going to be the subject of this message today. Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. There is one proper way to express your sexuality. For a Christian, that's in marriage. Any other thing is sin. Period. Whether it's with a, 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 a life partner, as the world calls them, or it's with... Uh, a, a, a woman or a man outside of marriage, it's sin, period. Let's just make sure that, that we understand that. This union that God set up, He set it up before He set up the temple, before He set up the law, before He set up anything. God, in Genesis, established what we understand to be marriage, and you'll find that in the passages we'll be looking at today. Marriage is supposed to be held in high regard. Where do you think we are on the regard meter? One to ten, ten being the worst and one being the best. Where do you think we are in our world today? Don't answer. Where do you think we are? And I believe a lot of times it's from Christians who believe they have validation for doing the things that they do. It says here that marriage should be held in honor. Because sexual intimacy is the deepest uniting force of two people. It is the deepest uniting force of two people. This is why God holds it in such honor and why we should as well. It's not to be frivolously given away. It's not to be experimented with. It's to be given and understood as something honorable. The world would say there's no honor in it. Let's live together for a time and see how that works out. But the reality of it is, God's Word says, hold it in high regard, in honor. And it should be. Again, it would be very easy for those of you who have gone through the the messiness and the hurt of divorce. It would be easy for you to just turn me off right now. I hope that you won't. I pray that you'll continue to listen. So that God can do other things, not because I'm a good speaker, but because God's laid this on my heart and I believe it's good not only for you, but for me too. It's interesting because it's misuse to defile the marriage bed. It's misuse corrupts our lives at some of the deepest human levels. As a minister, one of the things that uh, I would share with you probably 50 years ago, a message like this, we wouldn't dare preach it. In fact, probably, probably a preacher would be run off for preaching such a message. And we would be saying, oh, my goodness, my children are sitting there. I'll tell you what, then let them see the best marriage they've ever seen. Amen. If you're a single parent, be the best parent you can be. Right. Show them things about God. Don't neglect those things. It's interesting because many people change after a sexual encounter apart from the marriage bed. I have watched young women who have been devastated to the point of suicide. 39 years I've dealt with things like that. Breaks my heart because they never can get past the psychological damage that's been created. And oftentimes it even goes into the physical. Because they feel such shame. They feel such guilt. Sometimes the only way they think they can get out of it is suicide. I'll tell you, suicide is the wrong answer. But some of you may still be living with some of the shame and the guilt of things in your past. And I want you to know, that's not where God wants you to be. Psychologically, shame, guilt, fear, hurt, betrayal, security issues, and even to suicidal thoughts. 
Don't tell me this doesn't matter and it's not that important. You may be saying, oh, it's not that important to me. I'll tell you what, there's people out there that this matters to a great deal, even if they're not Christian because they know that something's been violated and they just can't figure it out. The marriage bed's been violated. It's after the accomplishment of whatever deed it may be, the guilt comes in. What have I done? Physically, I've seen those who refrain from caring for themselves. They don't care anymore. I have a cousin that was molested by her stepdad. The only way that she could figure out that he would leave her alone is if she became obese and he had no more desire for her. To this day, she's still there. She's suffering now with all kinds of physical ailments and problems, but that was her only solution at the time. It's interesting because when we look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I invite your attention over there. It says that when we come together, it's the same idea as when we come together with the Lord. In fact, the Lord ought to be a picture of what happens when we accept Jesus Christ. We have formed a union with Him. We have formed a union with Him. And here's the thing, if we don't take marriage seriously, how can we take our Christian relationship with Christ seriously because he takes it very seriously. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20, I'm just read verses 15 through 18. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. That's all the way back in Genesis. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. I'm going to stop there for just a minute. When God created Eve... He said these words that I just shared with you. If In your Bible, it should be in quotes and you should have somewhere in your margin. If you have a reference Bible, it should take you all the way back to Genesis. The two shall become one flesh. When you accepted Jesus Christ, the picture of what took place was you are a sinner apart from God, apart from Christ. And when you accepted Jesus Christ, you realized, I want to be in that relationship with Him. You see, sin broke that relationship. And when Christ died at Calvary, what he did was said, I can restore that. He's already demonstrated how much he loves us by giving of himself to the full measure. And when he says, I want you to come and be saved, he's not saying, I want you to just know about me. I want to have a relationship with you. An eternal relationship that says, I love you and I'm looking out for you. Love me. Love me enough to do what I've asked to do. Not, not because I've told you to, but because you love me so much. He goes on to say in verse 18, flee immorality. This is a, in the Greek, it's a present, present imperative. This present imperative means don't stop. Keep running. Continually, I have to tell you something. Temptation is something that you will not escape. All are tempted. It's interesting because as I think about that, most of us would say, I don't need to flee, to flee temptation. I'm a pretty strong Christian. Let me tell you something. Even the animals know when to fly a different direction. What's happening is when you say, oh, I can handle this. I'm strong enough in Christ. Let me tell you some, there's some things about immorality that are very difficult. And because of that difficulty, you will find yourself thinking you can get away from it and it will be the very thing that ensnares you. I like to dove hunt. If you'd like to invite me to go, I'd love to go. That's the end of that commercial. But it's always interesting to me That I can be down on the ground, if that dove can see me, you know what they do? At least I think they do. They fly somewhere else. 
they know I'm there. Duck hunters will tell you that's why they get in a duck blind. You've got to be all decked out. Turkey hunters will tell you that those birds are pretty smart. They see movement. If there's smell, if there's all sorts of things or any minor, minute little thing going on, guess what? They will run. They're not dumb. But we are. We're the bird that flies along and says, that number eight shot ain't going to touch me as we're falling to the ground. You see, sexual immorality is one of the most difficult things that all of us will face. Male and female. Well... In verse 18, the second part of that, it says flee morality, which means don't stop, move away, get away, run, don't fly into the net, don't fly into the bullets. But in the second part of that verse, it says every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. There's a unique distinction about sexual sin. And I would say to you today that sexual sin isn't nothing new. You may be saying, oh, he's preaching that because of what's going on. I've got to tell you something. You ought to go back and, and study uh, the Greek civilization. Go back and study the Medes and the Persians. Go back and study, even through the Bible, you'll see that there were societies that had uh, uh, prostitutes that were within, the, within the, their temple of worship. And what you would do is you would pay money, you would go in and have a sexual encounter with them, and you would be told that that's communing with God. Thank God we don't have anything like that going on today. But the reality of it was, this isn't the first time civilization has been in the situation we're in. And you may be saying, whoo, so we're not so bad, oh stop it. When you're going against God's word, it's bad all the time. It doesn't matter that we can compare ourselves to the Greek. If you remember, a few weeks ago I talked about, we think, oh, I haven't sinned as bad as the person next to me. But the reality of it is, sin captures us all. We are in sin. We can't escape it apart from Jesus Christ. Whether it's big sins, little sins, it doesn't matter. It's sin and it separates us from God. Only Jesus Christ can bring us back to that relationship with the Father through His blood. Well, as we consider this and we look a little further, sexual sin is like is like no other. However, it can be very unique. And sin is sin, whether it's sexual or it's lying or cheating or murder or whatever the case may be, but it has a uniqueness to it. It has a character about it. It comes from within and drives the body into intentional destruction. You ought to go back and read the Proverbs. How many times it talk about the fool and the prostitute who says, Come on in, what are the stolen is sweeter. Bread eaten in secret is more yummy. It speaks about the temptress. It speaks about those things that will cause us to to go aside, astray from the things of God. Why do you think that a large portion of the Proverbs is about that? Because it was a real problem then, it's a real problem in Jesus' day, and it's a real problem today. John MacArthur, uh, MacArthur says, Sexual immorality is far more destructive than alcohol, far more destructive than drugs, far more destructive than crime. No sin that a person commits has more built-in pitfalls, problems, and destructiveness than sexual sin. It has broken more marriages, shattered more homes, caused more heartache. It causes lying, stealing, cheating, and killing, as well as bitterness, hatred, slander, gossip, and unforgiveness. Got to tell you, it is sin, and it has some very unique characteristics to it, does it not? Why is it there? Because we have a lifelong commitment to a companion that we did not choose but was built in. This companion is for life. It is at every turn of your life. It will not leave you. It will, not, it will speak to you in subductive language and try to convince you that the grass is always greener 
on the other side. If you submit, it will take you places you will regret having gone and guilt you or shame you into returning time and time again. It promotes unrighteousness. Its ultimate goal is to ruin your, your influence, to ruin you as a Christian and steal away your credibility in this world. It's called temptation. Anybody escaped it yet? You'll have it till you die. Wouldn't it be better to figure out what God's Word says about it and say, okay, now that I know what God's Word says about it, what can I do and how can I make a plan within my life that God's already designed to help see me through? You know, it's interesting to me. Why would God tell us to be sexually pure, to stay away from immorality, and then give us nothing to accomplish that? But He does. He tells us what to do. The choice, though, to do what God says is up to us. I want to analyze for just a moment, because here many of you would say, we're here, the lights are on, we're in a a place of, of religious safety, I don't have to have any worries about any bad thoughts, Brother Jack's hitting things and I'm saying amen in my mind because I'm sure not hearing them out here. I'm saying you're absolutely right, Pastor, and, and I'm right there with you. I got this temptation thing going on. I get this. I understand it. Well, in the analysis of it, in this safe place with the lights on, where the Spirit is right, away from those dark places or private places that you may go to accomplish those things that temptation would allure you to. From those places where you feel safe because nobody is watching, where you give in to the temptation, where fantasy becomes a virtual reality in your own mind. A place where there are no consequences. Guess what? We're not in that place right now, are we? We're not in that place. We're in a place now where we have to deal with the reality of what we're hearing from God. And I hope that you will take a great love for the things He's telling us about this. And it will cause you to say, I don't want no part of that. I'm joined together with Jesus Christ. I'm joined together with Him. I'm a part of this fellowship together and my sexual infidelity must not remain. Well, when we analyze this for a moment in this safe place, away from those private places alone, just our our thoughts on Him right now, how do these things happen in our lives? Chuck Swindoll, in his messages called um, A World Gone Wild, he looks at this, and I have to tell you that I, I modified it just slightly, but I'm going to give you basically an outline or at least an understanding of how these things work. I'm not doing it because you probably can go through, and all I want to do is identify with what you're already thinking in your mind. And B, I hope you're ahead of me already thinking, okay, what is it? What are those things that lead us to these situations where we're in those private places and we allow temptation to come in and lust to drive us? Well, first of all, it usually starts with some kind of innocent attraction. Let me tell you something. There is nothing wrong. And please, guys, and I say this to guys because I'm a guy, please don't use this as a reason to sin. But isn't it wonderful, all the beautiful things that God has made? Is there anything wrong with identifying the beauty around us in nature, in other people? In fact, I think it's even more healthy that we're able to tell somebody, you're very beautiful today. Most would think if that were said, what is he trying to do? Where is he going with that? Well, I'll tell you what, that's because we live in the world we live in. And guys, if you're thinking, aha, this is a way that I can do this, let me tell you, there's a second step to this. And I promise you, you'll be going down that road to recognize beauty. There's nothing wrong with it. God made beautiful things. 
One of those beautiful things he made was marriage. There's an innocent attraction. Beauty is not a sin. I know that ladies adorn themselves, and, and you, you look lovely today, ladies. Thank you for respecting the Lord enough not to come in your worst, but in your best. There are good-looking guys. Believe it or not, if you're going to talk about good-looking women, you ought to at least acknowledge, hey, that's a good-looking guy. I had this conversation with, I think, Howard last night. Here's the thing, I, I, in, in talking about it and, and uh, uh, these kind of things, uh, I was talking to somebody just yesterday. Uh, it wasn't Howard, it was somebody else, but I was talking to him and I said, you know, they said, you know, there, there's not too many guys I like with long hair. And she mentioned the name of somebody. I said, you know, he is a very attractive man. Some of you all be going, oh, pastor. <laughs> I... I, I don't mean anything by it. I just think that he's an attractive man. Doesn't mean that I'm going off the deep end or anything like that. My wife will assure you of that. <laughs> but the reality of it is, innocent attraction, there's nothing wrong with it. But there's a slippery slope that you start going down. And the second thing that Chuck Swindoll says is, after the innocent attraction, you can just walk away from it. Hey, you're pretty today and walk away and no big deal. But it's then when you go into curiosity. Curiosity is defined as interest leading to inquiry. Interest leading into inquiry. I want to know more about this. You see how it becomes a very slippery slope? Because it starts not just with uh, uh, an innocent attraction. It starts there, but then it moves into you thinking in your mind about a curiosity. Which leads to inquiry. And then when you begin to inquire, then you start comparing what you know of this person that you just met to in marriage the one that you've committed your life to. And you know all the flaws, all the idiosyncrasies, all the things about them. And it's easy to compare them against somebody you hardly know and can fantasize about where they are. Is this getting home to anybody? We start making comparisons. We start saying, hey, that's better than this. And as I shared with you earlier, uh, this is a truth and I want you to know it. The grass is not always greener on the other side. In fact, the grass over there is poison. And if you eat from it in this situation, it will bring death. And I'm not talking about death as in, you're dead. It could. But I'm talking about a spiritual deadness. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means a spiritual deadness because you have chosen to unite yourself with something other. other. And it fractures that relationship with Christ. It isn't broken. It's fractured. You don't listen to the things of God anymore. You don't listen to the people who want to help you with this. But I have to tell you something. At that particular point, it's not sin yet. What? I, I compare people all the time. And I'm not talking about in sexuality. I'm talking about I compare people all the time. There are people who I would trust with giving me advice about certain things. And there's others who know other things about that. And I would trust them. And, you know, I compare in my mind, who do I need to go talk to? Comparisons aren't wrong. You may be saying, I don't know, Brother Jack. But I have to tell you, you are right on the border. Because when those comparisons come, the next thing is the temptation. The temptation. What are you going to do about it? In fact, it's interesting because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and verse 28, Jesus is speaking and said, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust... For her, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, a lot of, a lot of people translate and said, if you even look at a woman, you adulterous man. 
Shame on you. I, I got to tell you something. God never said, don't acknowledge the beauty in this world. And I'm not giving you a scapegoat for this. But when you put it in your mind and that temptation comes and you choose to dream about it, lust about it, desire it. Notice what he says here. Lust is what brings it in. It's when you start thinking about it and making it what consumes you. The alcoholic will tell you they can't wait and all they think about is their next drink. That's lust for alcohol. The drug addict will tell you the same thing. Let me tell you something. The same thing takes place when it comes to sexual impurity. Once you've come to that place of lust, I've got to tell you, it's a scary and dangerous place to be because there's some consequences to it that we'll look at in just a moment. But when you begin, not because they have done anything, but because you start fantasizing and thinking about it in your mind and desiring it, whether it's for a woman or for a man, or whether it's for uh, whatever the situation may be in your life, that's when it becomes sin. Because you now have made it a part of you in your dreams and your fantasies. You're taking something that's unreal, and you're allowing it to become real. Temptation? Engages our imagination. Doesn't it? Think about it. What does temptation do? It engages our imagination. It takes us to places where we ought not to be and that it encourages us to linger there. And in lingering there, we begin to think on these things. And the Bible says, don't think on those things. Think on the things that are pure and honest and true. All we have to do is just be there for a moment. But that moment becomes longer and longer. When it turns into our fantasies and our dreams, it becomes lust. And I know there's some that say, well, Brother Jack, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on those first two things. If you don't do it, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to talk about that too. But right now, I need you to see that there are some things that it isn't just because you looked at a woman, you're going to die and go to hell. I do need you to understand what Scripture says about this. When lust takes over, this is what's scary. It systematically begins to remove in you what is pure and those things that God has taught you in your spiritual walk. Because when lust comes in, you have no desire except that. It becomes a quest. You transfer that lust into a physical desire. And you see why I'm saying this passion that comes up from within you, and that's why Paul is writing it to them. It comes from within you, it's unique. And then it becomes a quest. And in that quest, what's scary about the quest is you have stopped caring about anything that's important. How many people do you know? And in fact, even maybe you. And I don't say that judgmentally. You begin your quest and you forget about things like your wife. It doesn't matter anymore about her. Your families. Oh, if I could go back and tell the stories of the life that I've, I've shared and talked with people about and pleaded and urged men and women not to walk away in this sexual immorality, but they did it anyway. At the expense of some of the most precious things in their life, they did it anyway. And I've never really been able to understand it until you study it and understand this comes from within and everybody has to make these choices. You can't make them for somebody else. But the reality of it is, when they start this quest, they abandon oftentimes position. They abandon the very things that they've worked so hard to attain. They abandon their reputation. They don't care anymore. All they want is what they want. We've never been there, have we? They abandon their home life their commitments, their standards. You know, I, I hear people all the time, well, if you know Jesus, why are you doing that? Well, i got to tell you, 
when lust comes in, people are blinded to commitment. They want to make no commitments. This is why in marriage today, the marriage bed is defiled because no one wants to say, I'm going to wait until marriage because that is the purest time and the purest form of a relationship. And that's what God intended it to be. And I want the very best from God, not just settle for the leftovers. It's not about you saying, oh, I'm going to be sexually pure. I want you to know why you want to be sexually pure. Because God says that's the purest form in the marriage bed. But I want to experiment. The rest of the world does. Well, I've got to tell you something. That's what the world's going to say. They're going to try and take God's word and say, that's not what it says. Well, they have a reason to do that. You know why? Because they don't want to do what God's word says. It's a shame when Christians don't want to do what God's word says. They go, but God, that's so inconvenient. Do you know what you're asking us? God knew from the beginning. That's why it's the first institution he ever established. Well, not only do we lose position, reputation, home life, commitment, standards, you also become blind to any consequences. You may be saying, well, those are consequences. Yes, they are. But you become blind to any other consequences. You don't care what's going to happen to you. All you want is what you want. And as I, as I share this message with you, you're sitting going, Wow, I know people like that. Well, I'll tell you what, be careful because you may say you know people like that, but you have the same temptations living within you. I've had people say, I'd never do that. Six, eight months, ten months, twelve months, a few years later. They're exactly in the middle of it. Don't say, I'm exempt. You're not. Preachers aren't exempt. The statistics on preachers today is just alarming. Paul says that he preached in such a way as not to forfeit his right. And I've got to tell you, we've got preachers today that are standing in the pulpit that have had multiple illicit sexual relationships with women, secretaries, other women in the church. I don't think they should have a high-profile ministry and continue it because they're speaking. You may be saying they've been forgiven. That's right. But I tell you what, forgiveness isn't something that, bing, bang, it's done. i got to tell you, forgiveness is a road. While God forgives us completely, there's a road of humility that we need to walk. And in that road of humility, we come back to the place where God would have us to serve. It's not where you can say, I'll serve here anyway, no matter what God says. It's important that we see that, and I'll get off of that wagon here right now. It's interesting because when you choose to go down this road, you create your own narrative. The lie becomes the truth. Chuck Swindoll tells of a man that confessed to him, he said, I've, I've had this marital affair... And I've had it for so long that when I am having uh, 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 an intimate moment with my wife, I feel guilty because I love my mistress more. Scary, isn't it? He shares another situation and he said, there's one man that said, you know, I've been carrying on with this illicit sexual relationship and this adultery for so long, I can't even remember the names of my children. Talk about blinding things and things becoming a different narrative. And the world will give you that other narrative and say, no, 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 you're all wrong. I got to tell you something God had to design for all of this. And while this is a hard message to hear and some things that we can learn from, I say to the younger generations, pay very close attention to it. To the older generations, you're not above it. But I would give this to you as a word of warning because after you create your own narrative, after you have become blind to the consequences, you can't stop. And I don't know how many times I'm dealing with a man right now that is coming out of the fog of sexual impurity. And as he's coming out of he said, Oh my God, look at all I've lost. I don't want to go back and say, I told you so. But I do go back and remind him, Wasn't there a time that you were angry with me? You see the false narrative? I'm doing what's right. And preacher, you're just meddling. I'm not meddling today, folks. I have no desire for you except for the will of God. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, and I close with this. 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want to just share with you. This also deals with the same thing of sexual immorality. And folks, I've got to tell you something. It doesn't matter where you are in this. If you've got people saying it's okay to do this and have same-sex partners and all this other kind. Let me tell you something. That's not God's plan. And as a Christian, it ought to be something you reject. Not because you hate people, but because you understand what God intended it to be. And you desire to honor Him. It says this, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, and he says this, Finally then, brethren, we request, request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. I love this because he says, do more. Don't just say, I got this handled. If you know the temptation is walking alongside of you, you better do some things to protect yourself against temptation. You better do some things that say, I know how to run from this. I'm not tough enough to handle it. God, you know that. And that's why you gave me that escape. The biggest thing, and I, I, I just had this conversation just, uh, 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 I guess about three or four days ago. They said, Pastor, I didn't want to come to you because I wanted to keep going. I didn't want to call you before I did the things that I did wrong because I didn't want to stop. But now I'm looking at all the things that have come up in my life and it scares me. The fog clears. The Bible encourages here and what Paul is trying to say here, exceed, do more, be prepared to run. Mark in your mind those places where you go, where it's private, where no one is watching. Mark that in your mind and say, I'm not going there. My dad used to always tell me, he said, son, the best way to avoid getting a young lady pregnant, stay in a group. Works. Put people around you. And i got to tell you something. For those of you who may be dealing with these issues, there are people all in this room who don't need to know all the things, but they'll be willing to talk with you, be willing to love you through this. There's something so much more. But we're scared. Actually, I don't think we're scared. I think we want to continue. So we choose not to. We'd rather ask for forgiveness than try and seek permission for something we know is wrong. We joke about that, but that's the very nature of sin. He says here, excel still more. I'm glad to hear that you're doing what God has said to do, but do it even better. And notice that this is tied to this message because in verse 2, for you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice whose authority it comes in through, Jesus Christ. This isn't them standing up and saying, this is our thought, this is our opinion. It's not my thought, it's not my opinion. I agree with God, but I want to acknowledge to you today that this is coming from God, not me. He says this in verse 3, For this is the will of God. You're saying, Brother Jack, I'm going to go home and take this message under advisement. I'm going to pray about it. I'll see what... I've got to tell you something. He says here, this is the will of God. And what is the will of God? Look at the very next verse or the very next part of that verse. Your sanctification. Your growing. God wants you to grow. And excelling means you're growing. But let's look at the rest of it. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. But Brother Jack, you just don't understand. You're right. And what I don't understand is why we would ignore what God says about marriage. Amen. What I don't understand is why we would take so lightly the God whose hand we're in. Why we would take that so lightly? Why would we claim to love Him and to know Him and yet disregard Him in such a way and in such an area as this? When it talks about possessing His own vessel, that could be the wife or it could be 
themselves. Because there's some things about our relationship in marriage, and I tell this to people all the time, it's 60-40, not 50-50. You care 60% more for your mate than you do for yourself. I've got to tell you, if more marriages worked like, that way, we wouldn't have half the trouble we have in our world today. But he goes on and he says, in verse 5, not in lustful passions. This is the very thing that Hebrews is speaking about. It says, don't defile the marriage bed. In your lustful passions, and we've just gone through all of the things the lustful passions take us to. Why would we want to be there? He says, like the Gentiles who do not know God. I preach this message to you with my heart wide open. I preach it because if you claim the name of Jesus Christ, you know God. You know that the things, if you're involved in this or you're down those roads or thinking about those roads, you know that it's wrong. The sinner knows that it's wrong and the sinner is going to fight tooth and nail to accomplish what they want to because they're not driven by an understanding from a loving God. He goes on and says, and that no man transgresses and defraud his brother in the matter because of the Lord, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification to grow us. So, be careful here now. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This isn't about whether I'm right or you're right. It's about he's right. It's about us acknowledging who he is and saying, you're God, not me. These three passages work together because they all talk about sexual impurity, fornication, those things. And and notice what it says, don't let that bed be defiled. They already knew some of these things from Paul's writings, but they also knew it from their history as Jews that it was a serious matter. I would share with you as I close this message, the last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I stopped in the middle of it and some of y'all are saying, but pastor, you need to finish that. Yes, I do, and I'm about to right now. Because it says in in 1 Thessalonians, it tells us in chapter 4, this was the last verse I read, so he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. In 1 Corinthians, it tells us in verses 19 and 20, or do you not know? Or do you not know? That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Whom you have from God. And you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. I don't know any better way to finish this message. My prayer for you. And for all who claim the name of Christ, is it will take what God says about marriage and about sexual purity and run with it to the glory of God. Not to judge a world, the world we already know where they're going to go. And I don't say that flippantly or uncaringly. We know where they're going to go and what they're going to try and accomplish. But let what you do reflect the glory of the one who's sanctifying you, whose spirit lives within you. Just because the world says it's okay or other Christians say it's okay, it's just they're ignorant about God's Word when it comes to these things that are precious to Him. Would you stand with me?